Hi, welcome to the bathtub. This is the old master bather, Scott Bradfield, the old master bather's dog, Lucky. She she's um, she wanted to get up in my lap. We never know what's going to happen. And she didn't try to bite me, so that was a very, very good when my dog doesn't bite me. This is the old, uh, this is uh, reading great books in the bathtub. We have a special theme uh, sound effect for this this new show. Hold on a second, listen carefully. And now, once again, here's Bullwinkle's Corner. Bullwinkle's Corner. That's right. Um, we we only we get all our sound effects from. Our, our cultural references in the bathtub are pretty slim, you know. We go, we got J Ward cartoons. Oh, and the dog. Okay, so um, this is our uh, we call it Poets Corner, and we actually call it Living Poets Corner. Lucky can see out the window, so you can stay there if you want. I don't want to put her down because she she gets crazy. Um, we have the Sydney Green Street effect from the fan. I turned it off. This is our. It's supposed to be our first episode with 5,000 subscribers. 5,000 subscribers, not quite. We still, it's just inches. This is, the the bathtub is a game of inches. It's taken us years to just get up to 5,000. I think we're like 10 short. We had the big 5,000 subscriber episode without 5,000 subscribers. But lots of people showed up. Thanks to everybody who came. You too, Lucky. You and Dodo were both. Well, you were, you were there in spirit. And uh, Dota Lucky's on uh, Gavra Penton now. I just heard there was a piece today about on the radio that Gavra Penton is the most overprescribed drug in in the world, <laughs> but it kind of helps Lucky from it. She doesn't attack us too much when she's on the on the Gavra Penton, do you, Lucky? And um, the, the, we're wittering around today is a big debate day. I can't watch debates. A, I can't I can't watch for two three reasons. I can't watch that idiot. That guy becomes president again. I can't. I just can't see him watching on TV, and I can't watch the Democrats screw it up again. So, we'll cross our fingers. Hope old Kamala does a decent job. I'm not going to watch that stupid thing. I'm going to do stupid videos, and here we go. So, if this is, it's called, it's called Living Poets Corner. We did it, uh, our first one because our 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 bathing buddy Bob Black, bathing buddy Bob Black, sent us some poetry, which which was cool, and we did a Louise Glick. Louise Glick, you can get down. Go ahead. I don't, want to, I don't want to pick her up. We had a very good time. It was a very, very good session in my lap without any craziness. And uh, Louise Glick, we learned how to pronounce her name. And we learned that she was dead. So there was our first Living Poets Corner, and, and we did it with a dead poet. But, you know, I don't want to call it Dead Poet Society. That, that, wouldn't make it, that wouldn't be a good name. And I think all poetry is living poetry. So, so we'll try to do living poets when we can, but we're just, basically the premise is all poets are living. I'm going to do today a writer who, I'd be curious what some of the poets out there think. Sonora Babb, we've been talking a bit about Sonora lately. I just did a long piece on her for the, uh, the, the New Republic, one of the places I do, I like to work for and I enjoy working for the most. And um, I get to do longish pieces and I spent a long time reading her and enjoying her work and reading a wonderful biography of her life, which we'll talk more about by Iris Jamal Dunkel, The Life of, the life of Sonora Babb. It's coming out in November from University of California Press, and uh, in the course of reading it, she's famous. She's famous. We've talked about it before for writing this book called "Whose Names Are Unknown," about the Dust Bowl, and it's about a bunch of a family in the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma, where Sonora Babb was raised as a child, and all this sort of happened to her, and her farm got knocked out by the Dust Bowl and by the drought, and then she moved to East Colorado. And eventually California, but she she sort of grew up in in Grapes of Wrath territory, and then later in life she worked in California at the uh, at these sort of state sponsored uh, uh, refugee camps for all the all the, the Oklahomans, the Okies as they called them at the time, and she worked in some of those camps. And so she wrote a book about that passage from Oklahoma to California, which of course um, we know a famous book that did that. She c compiled a whole pile of notes, the the, the story of her life gets boiled down to this one story which is not it doesn't give you a sense of what her, her career was really like but she was on this camp and working on this refugee camp and, and gathering all this information for her novel and John Steinbeck showed up knew her boss and she let him have her notes she had a huge pile of notes in fact I have a copy of the the, the book version of it here somewhere gave them to Steinbeck and he used them especially the stuff about the refugee camps and all that those passages in Grapes of Wrath and then he dedicated the book, Grapes of Wrath, to her boss, Tom Collins, and never mentioned her name. 
which is the part I like Stipe, but that was kind of crappy. Anyway, she she couldn't sell her novel as a result of this because Grapes of Wrath came out first and no one wanted to publish whose names are unknown. She had a lot of other interesting things happening in her life. She was married to James Wong Howe, the great, a great cinematographer, an Asian-American at a time when Asian-Americans weren't even allowed on a lot of the Hollywood lots. And he, he you may know he's the most famous. He's, he, one of his early works was for, he did Citizen Kane. He, he did a lot of amazing jobs. But that was his, that's, that was, was sort of an extraordinary piece of work he did for, for, for Wells. Anyway, she was married to him and had a lot of relationships and had and she was a poet and a short story writer. We've talked about her short stories. I'm a big fan of her short stories. And I'm also a fan of her poetry. And her poetry is it's again, I, I don't it's not sophisticated poetic uh, structure and language and, and, and it, it's it's very direct, like everything she writes. It's very direct, it's very personal, it's very honest, and it's very reflective about herself and her life. She doesn't she she doesn't uh, gild the lily anywhere, and all of her poems are basically about what she feels and thinks and, and what she's been doing. I'm just going to read a few passages because I really, really enjoyed reading this book of poetry, and I pretty much, I think I started off being a little mixed about it, and then about halfway through it, I pretty much read the last half of the book in the bathtub just in one 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 in one soak, and I'm just going to read a few passages, and if you like her, you might want to go out and give her a try. This is a poem called, and she wrote poetry throughout her life, but especially near the end of her life she was writing. This poem is called, This is the Time and Place to Write a Poem I Thought. She reminds me a bit of two rut poets. She reminds me of Whitman. That is kind of long, kind of, they're, they're more kind of, uh, I don't know what, how would you describe them, long descriptive passages and reflective passages. And then she reminds me in her shorter lyrics a lot of Wordsworth, especially the Lucy poems. The very short, simple lyrics with a really, really kind of powerful sense of nat natural, natural life. Natural life. I'll shut up now. This is the time and place to write a poem, I thought. But why? When I cannot say what the moist earth is humming into the skin of my bare feet. The grass singing a green song around my ankles, and now my knees pressed to the cushion of tear moss. Feel the long, slow tides of the sea like breath in the summer land, my hands in the fragrant earth, rich with dead leaves, my hand placing a seed in full, knowing what its flower and fruit in a little time compared to Ian's will be. Uh, very much a sense of the world around her, uh, very much a, na a lover of, of the natural world around her. A few more passages. I like this one just because I like spiders too. There's a whole poem about spiders in her work in her office. I can't kill a spider. Um, and she's, this is about her, her identifying with the spiders in her office. Spiders. In the rainy season, spiders appear as if in migration or resettling. They like especially my workroom where books and manuscripts provide arbors and darkness. When I turn on the light, they run, escaping as if I am after them. But I am not. I move carefully in order not to hurt or molest one. I have heard they bite if molested, and that the brown house spider is now known to be as poisonous as the black widow. All are here. You have all become house spiders in this season. I haven't the heart to interfere with whatever native course or planless plan has brought you. That's a, I, like, I like all these poems. I particularly like the one with that one. Um, just read a few more. Uh, this is a very short one, near the end of her life. And it's sort of thought... I think it's a thought that older people should feel. And I like the way she expresses it. It's just, it's just called plea. Oh, let me die before my senses stand immune to these. The mystery of one new rolled leaf. The loneliness of winter trees. The awesome majesty of storms. The song in forlorn wandering winds. Oh, let me die before my scorn of young lovers begins. Lovely poem. Um, I quote a few of these in the piece I wrote. I'm going to read two more quick ones. This is called Vagrant Quest. And again, it's about when you get older, you just, just basically your life is becomes measured in losing things. Excuse me, I'm going to put my shirt on. What is this? Vagrant Quest. That doesn't, that doesn't attract viewers, I can tell you. 
if in some solitary hour I miss him strangely overmuch. She's talking about her hus her dead husband, I think. I may be blind enough to seek a place made richer by his touch. I may be lone enough to say that day his cool hand held this book. He turned this page and read this line. And God knows what it was he took from me that day I should vainly search in eager, half-expectant way to see his face lost in a crowd or find him as the night turns day. And I think I'll just close with this last one. I don't, again, I don't remember with these things. I've just tagged, tagged things that I really liked. And again, it's about the end of life, I think. And it's just called Essence. I am a wind blown out of the earth, the inners of the earth, over flowers that are yet to spring up from its edges. I am a wind blown through you, fragrant with swollen seeds, strong and free with the breath of things unborn. I am a wind that bothers the lock and sends the branch catching and troubling your roof and little soft sounds like thoughts out of me that have caught in your mind and will not lie down. I am a wind that will trouble your door and never come in. Anyway, I think it's a lovely book of poems. Uh, told in the Seed and Selected Poems from, from Sonora, the great Sonora Bab. And uh, again, we, we, I did have a long piece about her, um, but the main thing is her, her story seems to be boiled down to this one book. Um, and, but she, she produced all this other wonderful stuff, and she should remember for the good stuff, not the... This one piece of terrible luck she had. Okay, stay safe. Enjoy some poetry. You don't need to explain it to anybody. Uh, you can unbutton your shirt. You can unbutton your shirt and let the crazy dog in your lap. Anything to do to make make the poetry happy and make you happy with with your poems. Stay safe.